Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Wireless Sensor Networks for Fruit Growers, Applications, Tools, and Factors to Consider, which is sponsored by Onset. I'm Robin Sitberg of Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of American Fruit Grower Magazine. And this webinar today will discuss specific applications for wireless sensor networks and fruit growing operations, plus we'll discuss factors to consider when choosing which ones to use. We'll have time for some questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, type it in the question pane at the lower left panel of your screen and click Submit. You can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll answer questions at the end. Our speaker today is Richard Rodriguez. He's the Agriculture and Outdoor Market Specialist Lead at Onset. His responsibilities include the HoboNet Wireless Field Monitoring System and the MX2300 series of Bluetooth TempRH data loggers. So I'm pleased to turn the program over to Richard Rodriguez. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar again. Um, before I get into my presentation, I would like to uh, just talk a little bit about Onset. Um, Onset, uh, the makers of Hobo, uh, has been uh, manufacturing sensors and data loggers in Cape Cod, Massachusetts and, since uh, 1981. So we've been around for quite a while. Um, we're known for, or our products are known for uh, their reliability and durability. These products are, have been used uh, for almost 40 years uh, to monitor environmental conditions all over the world and are trusted by environmental um, specialists um, to endure harsh conditions, again, all over the world from the bottom of the ocean to uh, high up on uh, uh, mountains to provide reliable data when needed. So we felt that um, if a pro our products can serve those markets, they should be able to uh, give you the peace of mind on your farm. All right. So when we look at um, reasons to to consider uh, the use of, of uh, such technologies, um, you know we're all faced with challenges, or, or growers are faced with uh, uh, several challenges. You know, climate impacts, extreme temperatures that can lead to crop losses, uh, frost excessive wetness, creating uh, perfect conditions for pests, for example, environmental regulations that uh, pop up um, and seem to become uh, of more concern, whether they be limiting water usage, runoff, um, application of pesticides, uh, consumers uh, changing uh, their needs or, or their taste, uh, you know, focusing perhaps more on organically and sustainably grown foods, which may require you to change uh, your growing methods or documentation needs. Availability of qualified labor is a, a, a real challenge uh, nowadays. Uh, farmers having to do more uh, on their own with less labor, less time. Uh, all these create challenges that require um, the use of new tools to, to overcome. So what is a field monitoring system and why, why should you care? It's basically a system of tools with both hardware and software components and perhaps uh, telemetry units or with a process of recording and transmitting uh, the readings of an instrument um, that enable us to monitor different environmental conditions in the field. So for farmers, with this is uh, the ability to monitor microclimate conditions um, on farms and under, understand how those conditions may change from point to point. It's the ability to know what your crops are experiencing on your farm, uh, not based on, a weather, uh, on weather data that may come from an airport uh, 20 or 30 miles away or more. So why? Uh, well, time is money. So if, uh, if you're able to save time in planning, not having to travel to a location to a point, um, you're saving time, you're saving money, you're able to, uh, to keep that peace of mind. Um, and then these systems can save you, um, save you that precious time that can help improve your bottom line. So, uh, what kind? Sorry, was there a question? Um, so, what kind of tools um, are typically available? Uh, common tools or sensors um, typically enable you to measure things such as soil moisture, uh, really that t ties directly into irrigation, uh, temperature and relative humidity, water level, calculated evapotranspiration. Uh, you may also want to add your own uh, sensors with different input types so that you can um, uh, uh, perhaps retrofit something you have 
um, already on your farm uh, and say you want to monitor uh, the on-off state of a motor or pumps for, um, for irrigation, you can uh, often be, tie that into, into a, a, uh, a suite of sensors. So now not only are you monitoring um, the environmental conditions, but you can also monitor uh, your equipment. So some, some benefits of uh, choosing the right field monitoring system. Uh, can really um, can lead to reduced costs associated with irrigation by allowing you to water only based on plant demand rather than a set schedule. So instead of watering uh, uh, on that set schedule, you can uh, look at what your plants actually need. And again, this is done without ha actually having to uh, to go out and check in many in many cases. We can protect your crops and workers, cattle from frost and excess heat, uh, frost protection is really one of the uh, one of the favorite f uh, functions of a lot of uh, for a lot of growers uh, for a product like what we offer um, alert uh, we a lot of these systems will provide you alerts uh, for things such as uh, temperatures uh, that may uh, dip below a threshold uh, and thus uh, create a bad condition for your crop so um, uh, basically uh, frost alarms that, that will wake you up and uh, in the middle of the night let, letting you know that you may need to take action. Uh, you can protect uh, from pests and diseases that may flourish in specific climate conditions, you know, high humidity, low temperatures, for example. Um, alternatively, you can avoid applying pests if conditions don't warrant that their application, which saves you time and money, uh, and of course, uh, environmental impact. Avoid spraying when conditions are not suitable. Um, so if uh, winds are too high, uh, you can avoid spraying uh, at that wrong time. Uh, help ensuring you meet regulatory conditions for when you apply these pesticides um, or use water. Ability to monitor multiple points quickly, uh, crop planning, and um, Uh, now, additional uh, tools that are available that actually don't um, don't necessarily uh, uh, or are not necessarily part of uh, these sensor suites or these sensor networks um, are crop and uh, pest models that may be available to you that tend to be quite regional or um, area specific, uh, geographically speaking. Um, two examples that we ha that I provide here are NUA, um, uh, the Network for Environmental and Weather Applications uh, by Cornell University, and FON, uh, the Florida Automated Network Weather Network. Uh, these networks typically, uh, which are typically sponsored by universities, offer tools for irrigation planning along with crop models that use weather data um, to determine where a crop may be within its development cycle. Uh, they provide you pest models uh, that are also based off of uh, the specific environmental conditions at the microclimate level. So again, at, at a specific part of your farm uh, so that you can be hyper-localized. Um, your local network may provide you a view of, of uh, the risk level for uh, certain pests or insects, uh, whether those be insects or diseases. And then they'll also provide recommendations on how to mitigate those risks. The advantage of using these tools is the ability to take a more targeted approach to pest management and irrigation, uh, so help, which helps you eliminate uh, or limit the amount of waste, uh, whether that be water or, or spraying, uh, which also, um, in addition to helping your bottom line, uh, reduces the environmental impact. Some of these networks, such as Fawn and NUA, uh, allow uh, farmers or users of our stations to upload their weather data um, directly onto their databases um, so that you get those models, those uh, predictions, uh, again, specific to a point on your field. In many locations, uh, these services are free to you. When talking, when talking to, uh, about taking more targeted approaches to pest management, many of you may have heard of uh, the term uh, integrated pest management or IPM. Um, so IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests and their damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of uh, cultural practices, and use of uh, resistant varieties. 
pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that um, their application is needed according to guidelines and uh, treatments are made within, with the goal of removing only that targeted mechanism. So again, uh, really a uh, very targeted approach. For any of you operating in the NUA member states, I recommend that you take a look at, the, at these tools and models uh, that they provide to this end. Um, they will provide you different options for reducing the incidence of pests and will also provide detailed information on how to eliminate those when needed. With the right tools and models in place, uh, you can avoid spraying several times within a season um, and can target specific pests. Um, so again, uh, leading to, to uh, uh, noticeable uh, cost reductions. For NUA specifically, there are 15 member states uh, represented on the, on the map in green and seven affiliate states uh, where users can upload their data for a fee. So for the states in green, um, that service is completely free. Um, for those in blue, uh, I believe there is a $290 uh, yearly fee to get access to that information for that service. Now, that's the cost in terms of value. A recent survey, or actually a survey done a, a couple of years ago by uh, Cornell uh, University um, from uh, close to 500 of their users um, found that, 4, 000, uh, that on average, uh, farm uh, growers saw a savings of $4,329 from reducing sprays. Uh, $33,000 from avoided crop losses uh, due to pests, and um, the average per acre came out to about $2,000 in savings. Um, out of all those um, respondents, 75% actually saw uh, or stated they, they uh, saved on their spraying bills. If you uh, decide to uh, look into uh, something like this. Um, the, the typical system uh, for uh, an integrated pest management uh, with, that would work for either Fawn down in Florida or NUA in uh, the, the northern states, um, you'd basically be looking at, at six different sensor kits, um, starting with a, a remote station, which allows you enables the cellular connectivity, um, the leaf wetness sensor, which is uh, very important for mildew type diseases, uh, temperature and relative humidity sensor, solar radiation sensor, an anemometer or wind speed and direction gauge, and a rain gauge. Um, you can typically get into something like this in case you're wondering for about uh, $1,900 uh, and change. Now getting it into a little more of applications. Uh, we talked about uh, climate impacts, of course, uh, frost, or uh, just low temperatures in general uh, at the wrong time of year can really uh, damage your, your productivity or your bottom line. Uh, cold temperatures, um, you know, whether they be, um, you know, from citrus to, uh, to berries can, can uh, really lead to bad news. Um, though most plants require um, hot and cold temperature cycles throughout the year uh, in order to develop, um, again, uh, the, you know, frost at, during early blooms can be disastrous. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, a lot of farmers tend to uh, try to grow uh, blueberries, for example, uh, early in the season because early in that season is when um, it tends to be the more lucrative part of of the growing of the of the crop uh, or harvest. Um, because um, now that's when prices tend to be higher, uh, but with that comes the risk of uh, getting um, getting some late um, late frost, uh, also late late harvest fruits such as uh, we're in, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where we grow a lot of cranberries, and towards western Massachusetts, a lot of apples. Uh, frost can also uh, disrupt uh, entire harvests if not if not careful. Uh, our devices are often being used for frost prevention, whether they be with uh, wind machines in orchards and vineyards to irrigation in cranberry bogs and other berry type farms um, and protective covers uh, for different vegetables. So when you're looking at into uh, frost protection, what kind of tools would you need? 
uh, for all three uh, kinds of um, uh, frost protection that I mentioned. Um, we have tools that provide you real-time alerts, uh, again, when, when temperatures drop below a user-defined threshold, so a temperature point uh, which you would decide um, would be meaningful to you. Um, when using wind machines, uh, we recommend using two temperature points, uh, one at the canopy height uh, or the fruit height, and the other at about 30 feet in height. Uh, this is important to ensure that no temperature inversion exists where you would actually be pulling colder air down onto the crop, which would actually, actually lead to uh, freezing. When used with irrigation, temperature points are needed at the canopy or fruit height only. Uh, several points may be preferred to account for possible pockets of cold air. Uh, we know that cold air tends to is heavier than warm air and tends to flow like uh, water, so it will flow downhill and, and often collect in low-lying areas and around any obstructions such as walls or buildings that would impede that uh, air from flowing further. Uh, spray drift for pesticides, another common application for uh, this type of sensor. Um, so in, in addition to um, uh, looking for helping you define what the peak window for spraying uh, when using the IPM models that I, I discussed earlier, you also want to be sure to, um, to not spray during periods of, of high winds, uh, which could lead to uh, wasted uh, applications or having um, uh, causing damage to neighboring properties. Um, there are two ways in which uh, drift can occur, uh, particle drift and vapor drift. Uh, particle drift occurs when small spray droplets travel long distances uh, because of high winds. Um, so again, sprays end up in your neighbor's farm as opposed to on your property. Uh, to avoid this, the recommendation is to spray only during wind speeds between three and eight miles per hour. And again, uh, you can have, uh, with a lot of many sensor networks such as what we offer, uh, you can have look at that data on your uh, mobile device so that prior to applying those uh, chemicals, you can ensure that you're within that speed. And you can e even uh, set uh, thresholds so that if the uh, wind speed goes above or below uh, those points with uh, sustained speeds, then uh, you can, um, you can halt activity. Uh, wind speeds below three miles per hour can indicate temperature inversion, which can also cause other problems, and uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, another another uh, factor to consider when uh, spraying is uh, temperature, uh, because um, these chemicals can volatize at higher temperatures, such as um, high 80s to the 90s. Um, and low humidity, um, which will cause um, those droplets to, instead of settling on your crops, uh, volatizing and then being carried by any any wind onto your prop onto the neighbor's property. Uh, that's also something to uh, keep in mind. Um, again, coming to spray drift due to temperature inversion. Uh, these inversions occur when warm air, uh, which is lighter than cold air, rises into the atmosphere. Uh, while cold air settles close to the ground. During a temperature inversion, there's no mixing of air, which causes spray droplets to uh, not spread. Instead, the droplets remain concentrated in the cloud. Uh, like you would see on the, the image on, um, on the right-hand side, uh, you, get, you get a misty cloud uh, just above the crop, uh, and uh, any, any slight breeze can actually carry that uh, that cloud uh, onto off target. So inst again, instead of uh, you getting the results, uh, your neighbor's uh, property uh, sees the impact. Now for, for this application, uh, the tool you would need would be uh, anemometer, so wind speed and direction uh, gauges, and uh, temperature and relative humidity sensors. So basically two, two of these tools will, will get it done for you. And now irrigation, always a big, a big topic of discussion. Um, soil moisture sensors can help you determine when your crop, crops need water uh, and improve irrigation planning by looking at how moisture levels change with time. Uh, so you can, it, it really is a two, um, 
there are two values here. One, you can just you can actively check on on when um, when the stress level on your plant is such where you need to um, water, uh, but you can also look at it ahead of time to to make decisions on uh, when to irrigate or how frequently to to irrigate. Um, so say you're uh, you're considering um, applying some type of chemical pesticide perhaps, uh, but you know that you'll also need to water soon. Uh, by looking at the uh, soil moisture data, you can make a judgment call as to whether or not you can hold off on irrigation for long enough to allow um, your uh, pesticides to settle, for example, um, and not, uh, not have them counteract each other. Uh, you can also set soil moisture thresholds, which can uh, provide you an alert on your mobile phone when a, a specific um, uh, part of your, your operation needs um, irrigation. Now, in terms of uh, soil moisture sensors, there are, there are quite a few options. Um, uh, there are two, types, two main types of soil moisture uh, measurements available. Uh, these are volumetric soil moisture content, which basically tells you um, the percentage of volume of water uh, existing in your field. Um, and the other is soil water potential or tension, uh, which measures the stress level uh, of a plant um, or how much tension a plant needs to apply to pull water from the soil. Volumetric soil moisture sensors provide an accurate low cost me method uh, to measure uh, the moisture content of soil, but they require calibration. They depend on, on soil types and will will change from soil type to soil type and um, can actually be um, affected by the salinity of the soil uh, in terms of the reading that it provides you. The volu volumetric soil moisture sensors may also offer um, other readings such as temperature and electrical conductivity of, of measurements. So the, this electrical conductivity measurement may, may help mitigate the influence of salinity on soil moisture, but it, it's something to, um, that you would have to consider uh, when making a selection. Um, because soil water potential sensors, on the other hand, provide a view of, of um, the crop stress in pulling the water or moisture from soil, they're often preferred in agricultural applications um, because the measurement is for tension and not water content fac factors that I mentioned above, such as um, soil type and salinity, aren't factored into the results. Uh, you're only looking at how hard or uh, it is for water uh, plant to pull that water from the soil or how much water is actually available to your plant. So it's, a, it's actually an easier judgment call to make in many cases. Uh, looking at the table on the right, uh, that, that colorful table I created, um, you'll see how uh, the volumetric water content reading changes for different soil types. Um, so I have, we have uh, sand and clay there uh, for the same tension. Um, again, tension, that the the figure provided for tension is basically how hard it, or how difficult it is for your crops to pull water uh, from the soil, and uh, depending on on the soil type, uh, that will give you that will um, translate to a different uh, amount um, amount of moisture. Uh, so in clay, you can have a lot of water in clay, but it's really hard uh, for that plant to to pull in uh, that water. Where in um, sandy soil. Uh, there is less water retention, meaning uh, it won't hold water as well. Uh, water will will move downward um, quicker. However, uh, when water is available, it is a lot easier to plants to absorb that water. Now, getting into crop planning, uh, another common application we come across. Um, or determining uh, whether microclimates in a, lo a specific location are conducive to a crop of interest. Uh, perhaps you're growing uh, citrus, uh, you know, oranges, and you want to know if you can grow finger limes on part of your, your farm. I actually just learned what finger limes are, um, and they look quite interesting. Uh, so temperature sensors uh, can be deployed. Uh, for a period of a year or more to understand how temperatures fluctuate from uh, area to area. Maybe perhaps on your farm you've got a low-lying or high-lying area that um, is more exposed to sun for more hours of the day. And um, this can really lead to 
differences um, experienced by the crop, uh, or uh, again, uh, that's what we're referring to when we say uh, microclimates. Um, so by by uh, deploying these sensors um, ahead of time, uh, you can get an indication of exposure to low temperatures that could damage the crop and warm temperatures that are needed uh, for growing that crop. So you know that uh, you'll know ahead of time whether or not uh, you can expect um, the, the a specific crop to to do well. Um, some growers deploy our instruments before deciding what to grow on a farm. Uh, as you, the image uh, again on the right there. Um, we show a, a rather large deployment uh, we made with a customer of ours um, done uh, about 18 months prior to uh, to them deciding what to uh, plant, what types of crops to, to put out there. Um, and what they found was that depending on the elevation and the location, uh, they there was typically an 8 to 11 degree uh, difference uh, from point to point, and uh, which really created a big difference in um, how how uh, specific crops would do or the likelihood that they'd get damaged. Um, and so with that data in hand, they decided what crops were best suited for, for each location. Uh, in many cases, they were able to deploy the crops that they they were really interested in, while in other areas they had to uh, make do with something that was uh, that had uh, hardiness more aligned uh, with the experience, uh, the temperatures experienced there. Um, because this application requires more historical data over a long period of time as opposed to real-time data, our Bluetooth loggers uh, are often more popular than our cellular units. So um, they're units that you deploy, leave on site for quite a long period of time, and then eventually come back to them with a, um, a mobile device to offload uh, that data. You look at the, the data, uh, the temperature points in Excel, and uh, make your decision on what to do from uh, the comfort of your home. Now, factors to consider. So let's uh, assume that everyone is on uh, pins and needles now and ready to uh, go out and uh, uh, start purchasing sensors and uh, deploy a sensor suite on their operations. Uh, first thing to choose is um, um, a single station versus a sensor network. Um, so a single station basically uh, enables you to connect a variety of different wire sensors, um, and you you likely have a cellular transmit uh, data plan, uh, or you'd connect that to Wi-Fi or Ethernet. I make use of um, internet um, locally available. Uh, you can mo this will enable you to monitor weather conditions in one location. Uh, it's basically one station, one one cellular plan, or one type of data. Uh, connection, uh, and this is typically what is used for uh, for things such as uh, tying into NUA or FON, uh, the FON network. On the other hand, uh, you can opt to go with uh, something like the HoboNet sensor network, which is basically uses as its foundation the weather station, but then you can pick and choose uh, what type of sensors you like to deploy or what type of measurements you want to get out of your field in specific locations that you, you may want to um, uh, measure get several data points for uh, for your farm in general but then you want to say understand either temperature or soil moisture at different uh, locations so you can um, you basically be getting a weather station and then deploying those specific um, sensor types uh, in a network uh, around, uh, along your, your entire uh, field. Now, uh, the, the uh, first uh, factor to, to consider um, is ease of deployment. Um, how easy is it to actually set these, these things up? Likely the easiest uh, to do is uh, the push of a button. Uh, much like pairing devices uh, like you do at home with a router, or connecting a Bluetooth uh, headset, uh, you push a button, and each device um, that uh, you you do that to uh, gets it goes into pairing mode, and they basically find each other. Uh, that's actually what we demonstrate in that image on your screen right now, which is actually actually the method we use. We found that to be the most uh, the simplest and uh, hassle-free way to do it. You hold a button down for three seconds, a 
the antenna image blinks and uh, you know you're good to go. Uh, other devices require the use of an app, an app that will allow you to search uh, for um, devices in your in reach and you basically select that device and it gets paired. You can use dip switches, uh, so basically you select or reposition dip switches uh, in order to ident uh, connect the device to a network and uh, something that you know you may have done with garage door openers uh, and then there are uh, more complex systems which require programming and, um, and a computer science degree uh, some uh, so uh, these will um, well uh, that's quite quite uh, self-explanatory you basically need to, to do a lot of a lot more work to, to get them to work uh, for ease of deployment you may you may really want to find uh, something that um, uses one of the first two methods, so either the push button or or the app type uh, type setup. Also, within ease of deployment uh, comes mounting. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, spending time around a bunch of devices, setting them up, maybe not uh, may not be the most productive use of your time. Uh, so you want to look for something that uh, that's small and uh, can be can be mounted to a different number of of um, structures you may already have out in your field, like uh, fence posts. Uh, you want to look at the power source. Uh, is it battery power? Do I need to run a hard run a hard wire power to it? Um, many devices, such as our own, have um, built-in um, solar panels which recharge the battery. So uh, the device runs off of two AA rechargeable batteries, but the um, the power of the sun actually keeps those charged, so you really don't have to pay attention or service these units for uh, for up to five years. Uh, you know, how easy is it to mount them? Are there integrated mounting provisions? You know, can, uh, can do I have to screw? Can you screw them into a wood post? Um, use zip ties. Those are those tend to be the more the preferred approaches. Uh, zip ties. Yeah, everyone's got them, uh, and they're easy if you if you think you may want to. And move devices around. Uh, they make it easy. Enough, it's easy enough to uh, to mount them and then reposition uh, the item. Uh, is security a concern? So you want to look at um, how how much do these devices stand out? Uh, will they be um, easily uh, either stolen or or um, damaged by someone uh, using them as target practice, perhaps? Still on ease of deployment. You want to look at at software. How how easy is it to configure? Is it intuitive enough where you can um, get started on it and really uh, learn how to use it without much much hassle? What information does it display? Uh, can you set up um, uh, different uh, screens to to show you display the information that's most relevant to you? Uh, you know, if you're if you're out um, working, you may not want to have to spend time searching for, for specific information. Uh, so systems uh, like ours will actually enable you to uh, create your own dashboard so that in one screen you can get all the information you need. Uh, and then how easy is it to access data? Um, do you, can you uh, look at it on a different number of devices? Uh, is it specific to, uh, to certain devices? And then can you can you share the data with different um, colleagues or employees? Maybe some customers uh, would be interested in, in uh, looking at your data. Can you, can you share this? Can you integrate that data with other systems you already have in the works on your property? And uh, wireless sensor coverage. Um, you uh, want to know, um, the range, um, how depending on the size of your of your property, of your operation, uh, you may um, you may need a wide sensor network. So knowing uh, the range of each um, from sensor to sensor is um, is important. Um, can um, an often used um, point of comparison is line of sight wireless range. And um, and then the the frequency used. So what type of what type of signal is it, um, and how how good is it for uh, for your type of operation? Uh, so we actually use a 900 megahertz signal, uh, which we found to do better than the common 2.4 gigahertz signal, uh, which has a longer uh, advertised range typically. 
However, we find the 900 megahertz signal to be more robust, which um, uh, is less attenuated due to uh, plants and trees, which tend to be quite common in, uh, in farming ap operations. And then looking at wireless sensor, still within the wireless sensor coverage, um, there are different types of uh, networks. So you can go with a star network uh, where all the sensors have to communicate back to a central station, which then communicates the information to the internet which, where you can view it. Um, this limits the range of your sensors to basically the radius around the central station, depending on the, the max, maximum communication distance. If instead, uh, the more, a more popular approach now are, are mesh networks uh, where sensors can communicate through each other to get back to the central station. The advantage here is that because you can relay the information from sensor to sensor, you can extend your network of sensors out much farther from the central station. This increases the coverage of a single central station um, and brings down your overall co cost. You have the option to use sensors as repeaters in, um, in products such as uh, the, the HoboNet um, system to transfer information from one sensor to the next. Um, so in, uh, for example, in our case, um, we allow you to do five hops, meaning you can, use, uh, you can relay the signal from the farthest uh, sensor five times before it gets to the central station. Uh, what that means is that uh, with our 1,500 to 2,000 foot range line of sight from device to device, you can actually extend your farthest um, sensor uh, by 7,500 to 10,000 feet from your central station. And then if, um, uh, if you have a, if your mesh network is self-healing, uh, which, uh, such as the, the HoboNet uh, network, uh, the sensor network has the added benefit of uh, maintaining connectivity or finding another point to connect to if um, the, the relay unit is lost. So say you're, you damage uh, one of the, the sensors with um, with some farm equipment during your oper uh, you know your standard uh, uh, operation uh, that that unit that that was depending on that to uh, communicate to the central station will find another route to get uh, the communication through. Then actionable information. Uh, you want to look at uh, how easy is it to, to use that, that data or, or make decisions based off of that data. Uh, make sure you want to know that dashboards are compatible, again, with uh, mobile devices and desktop devices that you're going to use so that if you need to look at, at um, data to make decisions while you're on site, you want to know that you can pull that up on your, on your phone, perhaps. Uh, uh, you want to look for available models uh, that are integrate, integral to the software, such as uh, uh, reference ET or crop ET, uh, growing degree days, um, and different disease models. Uh, some uh, sensor manufacturers will, and data log manufacturers will actually include disease models uh, in with their subscription plan. Um, others, such as us, uh, we, we focus only on the devices it give you the option to tie into locally available um, disease models. Integration with crop management networks, again, um, you know, NUA from Cornell, FAWN, UC Davis has some, California Irrigation Management Information System, uh, Weather Underground are common, common solutions used. And um, coming back to what is uh, one of the favorite features uh, of our product, um, alarm notifications and responses. So, uh, do you, if if this is important to you, you'd want to consider uh, what type of um, alarms um, you can configure. Uh, how do you get those signals? Uh, is it an email? Is it a text message? Is there just a a bell on the on the device that will alert you to? Um, uh, to the issue, uh, you want to look at whether these alarms are in-station versus web-based. Um, in-station alarms do immediate responses. Web-based alarms have um, you've got a, you've got a lag time in order uh, to wait for a connection, uh, an internet connection uh, for the alarm uh, condition to be detected. And then, do you want to turn something on or off? Uh, integration with it with other systems may be important. 
If so, you'd want to look at, um, at whether or not uh, that system has the option for tying in a, um, uh, a switch, a relay, for example, uh, to initiate a pump in the event that, that you get an alarm. Perhaps you want to start um, irrigation uh, after you get a frost alert. Maintenance of historical data. Oh, skipped one too many there. Um, you want to know how long your, your data is stored for and um, whether or not it's available for your use. Um, you may want to refer to this data after several years for crop improvements. Uh, you may want to look at what you did previously when uh, conditions were, uh, uh, were similar to what you're experiencing now. Uh, perhaps you want to use this data for protection against uh, future claims. You, know, uh, um, you can look at environmental data you can combine our environmental data, the data we provide you with your records of uh, chemical applications to, to prove that, no, hey, the winds were, for example, the winds uh, when, I, when I sprayed were uh, well within uh, this range. Uh, perhaps you want to uh, use this data for support with uh, insurance claims uh, due to crop loss. Scalability. Um, how you want to... Uh, consider how easily you can scale your sensor network. Perhaps when you uh, first get started uh, with your operation, you want to start small uh, with a sensor network. Perhaps you just want to try it out. And uh, then as your operation grows or your uh, confidence or uh, reliance in the system uh, grows, you want to add uh, more sensors and more capabilities. You want to know uh, do you have the ability to add more sensors? What is the max range for that network? And uh, what is the maximum number of uh, sensors and data channels uh, capable? And of course, how much would that, will that um, cost to, to, to do after the fact? And uh, finally, total cost of ownership. Um, cost to consider, you want to look at, it's easy enough to compare initial costs um, a lot, many, sometimes, not not often, um, in our industry, our the prices may or may not be uh, may not be disclosed up front. Um, in our case, you can come on our website and uh, uh, view all prices. We we post everything; nothing is hidden. Uh, in other with other uh, options, you would actually have to contact someone for a quote. Um, but then there are annual fees and other recurring costs in some cases uh, that these can be uh, data costs. Um, uh, so if you have a cellular connection, how much will it, does it cost to transmit that data? Uh, some uh, manufacturers require uh, or charge um, de device fees. So in addition to data fees and uh, the initial costs, you also have recurring device fees. Um, Maintenance costs, is there, do you expect there to be any uh, standard maintenance or is it just, uh, you know, replace batteries when needed? Again, future expansion costs, if you decide you want to add more devices, um, how much will that cost as opposed to uh, versus doing it right up front? Um, in many cases, we find that there are actually local grants and subsidies uh, available. They, they may be uh, local to a region, and they may be part of an association, maybe say the Strawberry Growers Association that, is, that has funds and will do some cost sharing. We often see these as, uh, as initiatives uh, for municipalities or local re uh, watershed districts to conserve water. Uh, so you may want to look into that. Um, you know, uh, perhaps you, you can reach out to us. Uh, we know of a few, of a handful of them. Um, and can uh, can help you with that at times, depending on where you're located. And then time horizon, how long will the product um, be installed and will you be using it? Uh, of course, if you're only using it for for one year, then uh, it may, uh, you know, it may be a tougher payback, but uh, over two years uh, or more, it becomes a pretty quick payback. If you look at the NUA uh, survey data with uh, based off of their average costs, uh, it, it looks like you can pay pay off uh, this investment in uh, a year uh, or certainly under two years. And finally, who owns your data? Uh, is your data for your use only or is uh, the data used by a third party? Um, in many cases, the data is yours, not used by anyone, anyone else. 
uh, we have come across um, uh, some uh, manufacturers that, that actually use your data um, to subsidize the cost of the product. So they'll, they, I'm not quite sure how, but they'll work, um, use your data to improve crop models and then turn that around and uh, create value for, them, for themselves, um, again, to, to basically subsidize your business. And uh, with that, that uh, completes my presentation. I will turn that this back over to you, Robin. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'd like to open the floor for questions now. And if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the questions pane at the bottom left uh, of your screen and hit send. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in already, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the first one is, does Onset charge recurring fees for devices? Uh, no, uh, for for devices we only charge uh, the price upfront for the product, and then in the event that you need a cellular plan, uh, we there are data fees um, that that start at one hundred and fifty dollars per year, uh, and then depending on the number of devices and uh, connectivity rate, so basically the amount of data that you're pushing through, uh, they go up to two fifty or three fifty per year, depending again on on how many devices uh, you've got. Uh, for the most part, uh, you're looking at um, uh, that 150 to 250 per year range. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next question, which is, do these temperature sensors work with any cellular carrier, or is it specific? Uh, is it a specific carrier? Uh, so in the in the U.S., um, they work with T-Mobile and AT&T. That is a type of network uh, required. And then um, you also have the option to uh, use your own uh, SIM card. But again, that you're you're tied to that uh, that type of network. Okay. And let's see. Um, how many sensors can you connect to a hobo? Uh, so, um, on for HoboNet specifically, we have two options: uh, the RX3000 and the RX2100 option. Uh, for the 3000, you can connect um, up to 10 sensors directly with a, a plug-and-play type sensor, and an additional 50 wireless sensors. With the RX2100, which is our lower-cost option, you can do 50 wired sensors, I'm sorry, 50 wireless sensors, but only up to five wired plug-and-play sensors. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Our next uh, viewer wants to know, how do you see multispectral crop imaging working in conjunction with wireless sensors? Uh, it's basically the boots on the ground. Uh, for, uh, you know, the it's great to get that, that um, that view from the top, um, it, especially when you're looking at larger operations, uh, but actually being able to pair that up with um, with uh, sensors on the ground it has an advantage because uh, you get you'll, you'll actually uh, what we the feedback we've gotten is that you actually do see a difference uh, between uh, those images and uh, what your sensor uh, sensors provide you, and given that the sensors are there and don't depend are not, don't um, Inter or clouds and other weather uh, issues don't interfere with their readings, you can actually start to understand, okay, um, the, whether or not there's an offset in the, the actual reality versus the images you're getting. Okay. So we actually, we actually see them be used uh, together uh, in many cases for that effect. Okay. All right. Uh, the next question is, are the temperature center... I'm sorry, are the temperature sensors all real time? Uh, yes. So, well, they're real time, and then you would select how often you want the data to be pushed up um, to the internet. Um, so you can you can select to a few seconds or, or uh, every hour, depending on what your what uh, you're looking to do. If uh, you're looking for um, alerts, uh, then you um, there's a difference between uh, the sensor making taking a reading and the sensor uploading the information. Uh, for anyone looking for alerts, you want the sensor to take a reading quite often, so every minute or every five minutes. 
Um, and after that reading is taken, if, you're, if you hit an alert, that alert is pushed up to you uh, right away as opposed to waiting for the data upload. Uh, and, and then you can, you can have the data upload occur uh, much less frequently. Okay. All right, our next question is, how large of a field can your system cover? Uh, that really depends on um, on the number, the how how um, many microclimates you expect um, to to have, and how many, uh, which will determine how many points you want to measure. Uh, we've we've covered uh, with uh, the maximum of 50 sensors in, um, for a station. We've we've done everything from uh, you know 20 to yeah over 100 acres. Uh, again, that depends on on the um, uh, how many points you you want to to measure and uh, the avail uh, where you would have whether or not you're constrained with where you place the central station. So if uh, you're able to place the central station in a nice central location to the farm, you can really cover. Uh, cover a wide area. I hope that that answers, but it really uh, the question. But it really does um, uh, depend a lot on a lot of the details experience there. Uh, in which case, we have a few folks here that are great at being able to to uh, look at your property online and um, kind of help you gauge uh, what uh, the number of sensors and sensor types you would need. One final question here, and it's how long do you store data, and what happens after we stop paying for hobo? So we we actually keep your uh, data. Uh, right, uh, we don't have an end date for that data. Um, the the fee uh, that you that we charge is again for data only, not for HoboLink or our cloud platform. Uh, so even after you stop using our product. Uh, that data is stored and accessible to you. Uh, we do after after um, you're not using it any any longer. Uh, we do basically put call it uh, to simplify it. We put it in storage, and so accessing that would require a, uh, may require a request uh, where we would provide you that data where you can uh, you can download that um, via an ex into like Excel files type of type of documents. Okay. All right, good. Well, it sounds like we've, or it looks like we've gotten through all the questions. So we're going to wrap up the webinar. And as a reminder uh, to our audience, an on-demand version of this webinar will be archived within the next few hours. It will be available at the same link you used to register. And you can also find the link at growingproduce.com forward slash webinars. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. And of course, thank you to Richard Rodriguez and to Onset for making this webinar possible. Thank you so much.